What's up, everyone? Welcome to the My Favorite Horror Movie Podcast, the second episode. Uh, our first episode was great. We had Felissa Rose and Chuck Foster. We had a good time. And now uh, the second episode is going to be no different. And I am uh, trying to... And I'm catching myself right now. This is okay. So this is the the first one that we're gonna be putting out that has video. Uh, we tried with Felissa, uh, and uh, Skype recorded it messed up, and all you could see was uh, the, the 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 top of her, the bottom of her chin to the top of her chest, and that was it. And so we, uh, it, it was the the way that that uh, Skype framed us all together on the same frame. So we can't use that one, unfortunately. Uh, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna move on. We've we've uh, we've gotten it better and we worked it out. And so with uh, our second episode here, it's gonna be Mike Mendez, filmmaker, and Jonathan Martin, another filmmaker and festival head. And we're gonna have a great time. So uh, before I continue, I'm trying I'm trying not to say uh or um or any of that shit. I've already recorded this a few times. I recorded this intro last night, and uh, I listened to it back today to try to edit. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay, let me count how many damn times I say, uh. So I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Uh, I, I'm trying to get in in front of the camera. I'm, 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 a, I'm a behind the camera kind of person. But oh, well, I got to do what you got to do, you know. So... Uh, let's, let's jump. Oh, and you know what? I got, I have a few shout outs to, to do. Uh, thank you to dreadcentral.com and Josh Milliken for uh, promoting our first episode. It, it was a fantastic piece that they, they put out for us. And thank you to Alex Napawaki, a good old friend of mine and his partner, Brian of the horror nation podcast for having me on their podcast the other day. So, uh, let's uh, check them out too because it, that was a fun conversation that we had, and let's uh, let's get into Mike and Jonathan right away. So our our guest host of the day, guest co-host of the day is none other than Mr. Jonathan Martin. He's a Utah filmmaker, director, uh, film festival director of Film Quest. Uh, his uh, short films "Kiss the Devil in the Dark" and "The Creatures of Whitechapel" uh, are are super awesome and super well received along with an evening with my comatose mother which is probably the most decorated horror short film of all time or oh you know awarded i think is the right yeah that's the word for it yeah decorated yeah. with awards uh so and and so if you get a chance to watch his movies check them out they're badass and welcome jonathan welcome thank you thank you very yeah, much how for having me christian thank you for having me there and you know, thank you for that introduction. You, you know, you warm my, the cockles of my heart, you know, as far as that goes. No, and, you know, just so that it knows, once upon a time, I think Comatose would have been, it was for a while, you could say the most awarded, but um, that, that record has since fallen as far as things go. But, hey, we had it for a little bit, and it was a good time and, and what have you. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so I'm glad to be here. I'm happy to be here and uh, see where things go. Yeah. So uh, uh, how have you been uh, handling this whole quarantine lately then? You know, it's not the worst, although you get a little bored. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I, you know, I mean, that's me personally. That's not to make light of other people's circumstances and um, some of the unfortunate things that are happening in this world and, okay. you know, kind of navigating it. And I think, you know, for me, it's it's been a really great opportunity for creativity and mm -hmm. get a lot of projects off the ground. Um, that's me speaking as a filmmaker and as a creator. But uh, in terms of the festival and stuff, there's a lot of question marks in the air. You know, oh, like, yeah. I, I, we're, we're still going full steam ahead for September, but you know, the conversations are active and, um, and happening often as far as are we actually going to be able to do this thing come September and what are our options uh, moving forward? Right. And yeah. so there's a lot of just waiting to hear, you know, just kind of seeing what it is while still being proactive. It's just, it's, it's a different weird place to be in, but fortunately a lot of us are in there as well. Yeah. So yeah. And film quest is usually uh mid summer, right? Or toward the that end was our summer. first couple of years. Uh, okay. But the last, uh, the last three going into our fourth year, we've been doing it every September. Uh, as far as things go, uh, right around Labor Day. Actually, the first weekend's Labor Day weekend this year because it's a late Labor Day, but it happens to be on the dates that we are every year. So it's like, well, there it is. You know what I yeah. mean? And 
And uh, we'll see, uh, you know, that could always evolve and, you know, not to get too caught up into it and what the world of the festivals are and stuff like that. But um, we do have uh, an interesting, you know, time ahead of us. And, yeah. and there might be a lot of festivals that fold from this. There might be a lot of festivals that kind of, um, that kind of uh, collapse or, unfor you don't you don't hope that that happens, but it could, you could see this could have been the last year that we saw a lot of festivals this last season. And so we'll see, obviously, I think we're in a good position that that won't happen to us. Mm -hmm. um, we've put a lot of questions in place. Unfortunately, we're not one of these events that cost millions of dollars to put on, right? And that literally has tens and thousands of people that come to it. You know, we're still, we're in that kind of happy medium so that we can have it. So that we can manage things. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, it must be tough for all the for you guys and the filmmakers just uh, who have already submitted and trying to figure out how to navigate uh, whether or not it, the festival is going to go on. And so, I, yeah, I, I feel for you and all the other festivals that are out there and filmmakers that, uh, yeah, where, you know their 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 hopes of premieres are, you know, or or the their favorite festival that they were hoping to to uh, play in uh, is not not going to may not happen um and now te tell tell everyone about uh kind of the 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 gist the gist of your uh festival and and what you guys focus on yeah 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 um so film quest it's a genre festival right but we're not so much just horror or just sci-fi or just fantasy we're all the above right so if you think sitches or fantasia or even fantastic fest we're more in that vein um, than say like Scream Fest, which is more focused on horror, even though they have a few other selections of other um, varieties. Uh, ours is a little bit more the spirit of genre, so you can see westerns, noir, you know, sword and sorcery. You're going to see some of that at the festival. So they got that, and it's a nine day festival, so it's not just like a two or three day festival. It's nine days. It happens in Provo, Utah. Uh, which actually was a big boon for us. It's kind of one of those places that you wouldn't imagine something happening like that's genre related, but it's really, it's all a big party. It's like you're going to film camp when you're there. And uh, the camaraderie and the relationships that get built uh, last a lifetime. And a lot of people end up becoming collaborators and stuff like that. And, um, and so that comes out there. And that's what we really build and nurture on. Not only is it great films and great selections through the nine days, there's great workshops, kind of master classes that are done, um, you know, by professionals and all that, uh, you know, from around the industry. Yeah. And, um, but also parties and events. And we really get you involved with the community, but also amongst each other. And, uh, and even this last year, we had about, almost 10 filmmakers that were kind of, you know, hanging out for the last day. And um, they, uh, they didn't know what to do, because mm -hmm. that is one thing when you're in a more conservative town like Provo, uh, things are closed on Sunday. So I was oh, like, yeah. just come on over to mine and I'll cook a dinner and we'll all party and play some board games and stuff. And so, so there was a de facto 10th day of the festival and it was oh. so much fun. Everybody had such a good time that um, we're probably going to add that. We're probably going to add that this year, where everybody who kind of lingers and sticks around is come on over. We'll have a big party. I'll cook dinner for everybody, and we'll have uh, a good time. And, and it's another way to get that camaraderie going and stuff like that. And uh, and you know, for us, I guess that's our, our our mantra is it's more about the spirit of genre, the spirit of the community, and and bringing that together. Um, you know, I, I've played my fair share of festivals. Some festivals I just absolutely adore and love like scream fest like sitches yeah. and i've been to some other festivals that i won't name um that just they just don't have it they just don't have it and they're never going to have it with the way yeah. that they roll things and so i took those experiences and things and you know it's evolved over years and i think we've really created something really special that's a must go to festival destination um, yeah you, and in fact you, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have. I've been there, and I I, yeah. I wasn't able to go. What was it? I don't know if it was last year or 2018 when you had the My Favorite Horror Movie panel. Ah, uh, last uh, year. That was uh, 2018. Yeah. Yeah, 2018. Yeah, it was like Dave Parker and Ernie Trinidad and Jeffrey uh, Reddick. Jeffrey Reddick. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So 
Yeah, we do some really cool things. I mean, for us, where we're at now, we've really built a strong, and that's another factor into the whole September festival and everything that's going on. You know, we're not one of these festivals that just host a festival and we don't care if you're there. Like, mm -hmm. we're all about you being there. That's our strength and that's our blood. And, and so many people enjoy coming. That's why we get um, close to 150 filmmakers every year the last several years that have been coming through the whole festival, you know, from wow. out of state. And yeah. that doesn't happen. And so, uh, from especially younger festivals, and a lot of people don't realize that that's something we've really built in this community that we've built. And so, as a result of that, um, uh, you know, we, that's a major thing. That's why we don't want to do an online festival. And that's why we don't mm -hmm. want to do something that short changes the filmmakers. So, we, you know, there's obviously some things that we'll figure out, and all things going well and all things going right we'll be in a position that we'll be able to put on everything as normal and you know i'm kind of betting a little bit that filmmakers will be so excited to actually finally go out and see a festival and be with other filmmakers they're going to want to come on out in droves but not to get too caught up because i know we have other things to talk about that is you know these are the logistics where we have to look at that realistically and be like well is this something that actually is going to happen like, are we only going to see 15 show up? And if that's yeah. the case, it's going to be in our best interest just to maybe postpone. So we're looking at a lot of factors as far as that goes. Yeah, and so how, how are you keeping yourself uh, entertained or creatively uh, fulfilled um, while you're stuck at home? Uh, so obviously, i uh, finally getting some stuff off my plate that's been off on my plate for a while. You know, I'm really working to hustle. As much mm -hmm. as I can. When we get out of this, I want to be creating. And and I know that we're in this kind of unknown territory. We don't know what film sets are going to look like. We don't know um, what can even be made. I mean, there's a big talk. I mean, this could be like, at least for the foreseeable future, like really catastrophic for the mid-level, the mid-budget um, films. Because... Yeah. What you're probably going to see is, I think you're going to see a huge influx. This is me speaking from what I'm already hearing and conversations I'm personally having and seeing. I think you're going to see a huge influx in television. Like, I think you're just going to see mm. that boom on another level. Yeah. And you're going to see basically studios making big budget films and supplementing that with films that are really two or three million or less. Maybe five million if we want to get generous with it. And yeah. you're probably going to see less P&A. You're probably going to see a lot more, um, you're just going to see a lot more avenues. And so, because they're going to want to try and get, you know, that two or three million dollar film that makes them 100 or 200 million. I think yeah. you're going to see a lot more of that. So there's a lot of exciting, but, you know, the vibe I'm getting and conversations I've had with some distributors and some agencies and stuff like that is they're already starting to see a lack of supply for demand. Um, they're already, they don't have enough content to go out there. And this is just what I'm hearing, and this is what I've been told. And so that could even get more and more desperate in the next few months. And so as one was even speculating, he's like, he told me, look, like some really big names, and I won't tell you the names that they told me, but they said some really big names who normally would maybe be a million or $2 million payday. I would not be surprised if come midsummer we're still in some uh, holding pattern that you could get them committed to a project for a hundred or 200,000. Right. Uh, like, uh, like that's yeah. what you're starting to see the drop because a lot of people are going right. to, they're going to be asking these questions. Where am I going to get my paycheck? How am I going to pay for bills and stuff like that? How am I going to have my livelihood? And, and so I think as a creator, and again, I'm very aware of what's going on outside in the world, but I think this is a really exciting time if you're being proactive about it and really pushing and hustling and creating. So to answer your question specifically, I, uh, I've been building some pitch decks. I'm collaborating with a filmmaker, um, and he's got like a TV anthology series. Because uh, speaking of A-lister, I can't say more outside. It's a horror anthology series. Really cool. I built the deck for him, and he got. I can't tell you the name. <laughs> I wish I could because yeah, yeah. it's really exciting. But an A-lister did commit to the project yesterday. Oh, great. Uh, this is a, like, it's not C-list, not D-list, and we love them too, but this is legit Oscar-nominated A-lister committed to the project. Oh, um, right. and, but we'll see. You know yeah. what I mean? We'll see. Uh, there's so many things that go on that doesn't mean it's going to happen and all that. Um, so I've been helping. I've been working on that. Uh, wrote a kind of a proof of concept Supernatural Western 
um, that uh, it's called, they call her dead eye. And so ah. that's a lot of fun. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. I'm going to see what I could do with that. And then hustling some of my other projects and also writing children's books. I've been wanting to start writing children's books. And so, oh. um, so I wrote my first draft and my first one just a couple of weeks ago, then I had to do these things. And now I'm, um, I'm getting that uh, sorted out next, right? So, yeah. so, so I have about four or five that I want to write. So I want to get drafts of those out, and then, um, and then we'll see where everything goes, right? The, the idea is just to be creative and to get things going because yeah. um, things are happening still and being lined up, and I don't want to um, be left behind if I can help it. Oh, yeah. Well, I think uh, why don't we bring in uh, Mike Mendez then and yeah. uh, start discussing things. So... Um, uh, hold on one second. We'll patch him in. Okay, so let's, I'm going to stop recording for that one. All right, Mike Mendez, welcome to the show. Hello, how are you? Good, good. And a how's, little, how's, uh, I haven't done a... How's your okay. pandemic going? How are, how oh, it's going, uh, treatment? it's going all right. I mean, I've, I've, I've been, uh, just staying in, trying to be creative. You know, I wrote a script last month and still writing that, uh, you know, got the first draft done and, Good. uh, you know, dabbled in music a little bit, uh, you know, did a, put out a track and then, uh, now doing this podcast. So I'll be jumping from thing to thing a bunch. And how, Please. how are you doing? I'm okay. I mean, I, I, you know, for better or worse, don't get me wrong. I'm sure like all of us, we have our moments. But but I, I've been dealing with it pretty well because I think I've, I've had a, you know, a lifetime of, of, you know, preparing for this moment. It's, I feel like, no, I've kind of been living in isolation for for a long time, really. Uh, just, you know, I just yeah. we had weekends where we could see other people. So it's like you take that away. Then it's like, OK, other than I can't go to the gym and I can't eat out and I can't go to the movies. My life is pretty much the same. Uh, so it's just it's just with a, you know, it's it feels a little bit like a summer vacation with a higher body count. Yeah, and and so I, uh, you've been uh, making uh, making some short films to keep yourself busy. That's for sure. Uh, I have, yeah, I yeah. Them on been, Instagram. That has been my my way of of coping to a certain degree. I've, I've always loved Instagram, as far as you know, because you know, I'm sure like a lot of us, like I was making movies when I was a kid, and it was you know your your either you know dad's video camera or Super Eight or whatever, and you know. Ever since uh, Snapchat and Instagram, I just love the idea that, you know, in your pocket, you essentially have a movie studio. And for the last, like, two years, I've been trying to get, like, instinctual where if I see something that my first instinct is to grab my phone and start recording it just because, you know, that was sort of like kind of wanted to do because I was like, you know, but, you know, I just wanted to kind of, you know, train my brain to just be like, you know, always having the filmmaker mindset on so that I'm always making stuff. So, yeah. I, and it always, I always had this weird idea that just for shits and giggles, wouldn't it be funny if like you, you start an Instagram and it's just you, you're doing whatever mundane bullshit. And then it, it slowly starts to escalate and then it really starts escalating. And then there's lasers and explosions and, you know, and, and it becomes this kind of thing. And, and so yeah. I, and it was always just sort of a fleeting thought of like, well, that would be amusing for my Instagram followers to just sort of see this thing escalate. And then, um, you know, but I never thought I'd actually do it because it's like, well, who has the time for that? And then yeah. to my surprise, uh, something very strange happened uh, and all we were sent to our rooms indefinitely. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, and all of a sudden, the, the bigger thing was, you know, and, and on, honestly, the, I think the big difference for me is that I, I, as an artist, I'm no stranger to unemployment. I, I mean, I, I do really try to keep busy, but, you know, especially in the film business, it's it's almost unavoidable at some point. I've been doing this 23 years. Uh, uh, it's almost unavoidable that at some point you're going to you're going to get a dry spell. Yeah. Uh, and I was always very crippled with with guilt when that would happen. I was crippled by, you know, just, just feeling shitty about yourself and very self-deprecating and, and just, just feeling guilty that, like, I should have a job. Oh, my God, what a what a worthless piece of shit I am, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but but with uh, with the pandemic, he, that guilt kind of went away. You know, I, I did not have that guilt because for better or worse, my only skills are in the movie business. You know, I either write, direct, edit, act produce that's all i do i can't do anything else i i would have a hard time at starbucks i'd have a hard time at mcdonald's i you know i'm i'm pretty worthless yeah. <laughs> uh unless it's film related 
so yeah. so I really, you know, they're they're not making movies now. There's there's just not. You know, I was I was acting in a movie right before, right during when this happened. We had to shut down. Uh, uh, I came home, uh, and you know, I, I I thankfully surround myself with lots of fun stuff, so I, I don't get bored easily. But I just felt for the first time, I was like, yeah, wouldn't it be fun to kind of like, you know, like I'm I'm surrounded, I have all this stuff. Uh, be fun yep. to, to make some short films. So I did. And, and honestly, I was just sort of planning it as a kind of a one off or, you know, make little things here and there. But the reaction was so overwhelming uh, and uh. it was so positive and it was so surprising because I'm so used to making stuff and nobody giving a shit. Uh, that I was actually really <laughs> endeared uh, by the fact that that the timing of it, people seem to want a, a, a silly laugh and. I was like, oh, you guys want me to play with my toys and film that? I, I can do that. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> so everyone has kind of continued uh, encouraging me to do it. And so I've been doing it. And, and it's, it's great for me because it keeps my mind off things and it keeps me busy. And people to be enjoying it. So I was just sort of of the mindset of like a thousand people smile, you know, then that's my day is well spent, you know. So, yeah. so that's what I've been doing. Yeah, and if anybody hasn't gone to um, Mike's Instagram yet, yeah, head over there and uh, make sure to watch his films uh, and, and the 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 latest Instagram shorts. Uh, that would you? That's probably what you would call them, right? Yeah, Instagram, Instagram short. Shorts, yeah. You know, yeah, totally. Short and, and sometimes they're just you know stupid little you know side little things, but then sometimes I, I kind of you know have gotten into animating and making movies. Uh, so so it all depends. You never know when they're going to come. I, I'm working on a a big one right now. Oh, uh, so, so it might be a minute before the next one comes, but, but, uh, but I, I hope it'll be worth the wait. So. Oh, good. Yeah. And, uh, so tell, tell us about, uh, I know Jonathan has seen, uh, he saw the Guillermo, the one it's called Guillermo, right? Guillermo. Uh, uh, it's called, well, there, there can only be one, but, but yeah. With, uh, yeah, Guillermo yeah. For, oh yeah. There can be, okay. Yeah. So, uh, and if you guys haven't seen it, it's about, uh, um, you know, Mike's found out there's some cookies being stolen from his uh, kitchen and, uh, it turns, it comes to find out that, uh, there's a whole lot of nefarious situations going on when, while he's sleeping. Uh, right. and, and it turns into it this big animated to, epic. I love it when people try to explain it. Cause even when I hear it, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, but but that's been the case on a lot of them is that, you know, I try to explain what I'm pl working on and I'm like, I don't know what the hell is wrong with me. I don't know. But yeah. So that's yeah, the for, for the kids out there, like uh, anybody that's uh, there or anybody that's starting off a of filmmaking, I mean, you have the, you have the essential things that you need right in your pocket. That, so that was, with your that phone, was the whole goal, you know, was just, it was very much that like, you know, I, I just wanted to, to make stuff that you could do on your phone. You know, it's like I, I started upgrading a little bit, you know, and getting a little fancier by incorporating like Premiere and the editing system. Yeah. But at least at the beginning, um, you know, it, it the rule was for myself, it could only be created on the phone. So whatever apps and whatever, you know, filters and whatever that I could find on my phone. But I, I tried to keep it, okay. you know, contained to that. So, yeah. And so how you do how are you doing the animation then? Uh, you know, as as old school as possible, one picture at a time. You know, yeah, uh, the the feels. only difference between between what um, between what you know I was doing before and now is I got a tripod. You know, I got a little tripod, so mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well now I can animate things. And then uh, you know, now they usually all come with like some Bluetooth remote control, so you can just you know click away. So yeah, but it's as as old school as Willis O'Brien and you know and uh, Ray Harryhausen. It's literally taking. A model or a toy and just taking a, a picture on your phone and then i import that into you know into premiere and start manipulating it from there yeah yeah that's great and uh and you're doing all the voices i assume i do all the voices yeah i mean that's sort of like the the personal challenge is just to try to make them all by myself you know because yeah. i was sort of like you know that's kind of unique it's just kind yeah. of a, a unique way to do it is like to really do everything you know Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I saw uh, you you and I both uh, uh, contributed to Sarah Nicklin, our friend's uh, birthday video, uh, and 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 then you had another kind of epic uh, Annie song for uh, uh, tomorrow. What is the song called? Yeah. Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. Uh, yeah. It's tomorrow. Yeah. Annie. Uh, yeah. and, and that one was uh, pretty fantastic too. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. That, that one was just that. sort of, uh, you know, I just got a, a random idea in my head of like, you know, cause everything is so depressing right now is that, you know, and I thought about the great depression and the song tomorrow was about the great depression. And it was a, you know, a song to uh, cheer people up 
from then. And so I was like, oh, my God, that kind of applies to now. Uh, and then uh, Sarah's birthday was coming up. And uh, I yeah. was like, well, I, not that I needed an excuse to make them, but but that was an extra excuse. I'm yeah. like, I'll do it for her birthday, sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so uh, uh, I, I asked her, her boyfriend, Sean, what, what what kind of creatures does she like or what kind of horror does she like? It's like, oh, she loves vampires. So I'm like, oh, I got that. Mm -hmm. So so there there it was. Yeah, yeah. I, I went the Exorcist route since that was her favorite. She's in the first My Favorite Horror Movie book. I, I went Exorcist. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, good. You've got that that extra insight. That's good. I, I, played, a, I played a priest. Uh, 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 scolding her for not uh, apologizing for Father Marin's death. Uh, oh, nice. I, okay, cool. I photoshopped her into Reagan in the bed and everything. So, yeah, I had a good time that's doing awesome. that. That's awesome. I, yeah. I love all the quarantine creativity that's coming out. You know, I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen, like, that stuntman one that was making the rounds yesterday uh, where, like, you know, 40 different stuntmen, like, threw a punch at the camera and then the other ones react uh, and, and you sort of pass it on. And oh. they were getting... More and more elaborate, like throwing themselves through tables or like oh. rolling down stairs. But it's really cool. It's really like, man, you know, people are getting, you know, even with the limited resources. I think that's what's kind of exciting to me is like if you take away everything, you know, and yeah. just kind of go to your absolute, you know, most limited stuff, you can still be creative and do exciting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so all, all three of us have kind of a connection with the, our love for uh, horror comedies. Uh, John, Jonathan's favorite horror movie is uh, uh, one of my favorite horror movies as well, Drag Me to Hell, uh, Sam Raimi. And then um, Mike's favorite horror movie is Evil Dead 2. Um, you know, uh, uh, what was it that drew you, Jonathan, to to uh, to Drag Me to Hell and to horror comedy? Like, and, and that's kind of been a big influence into your your short films too, because most years have. Either it's a full-on horror comedy with you know dark elements, or uh, or it's kind of a darker film with kind of uh, whimsical elements. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that just kind of happened, you know. It's it's one of those things that you start to develop a voice, and as you actually start to make a film, you, I think I don't know how many people go in. I think let me let me take a step back there. I think a lot of people go in thinking that they're going to be one thing, and then as they actually start getting into it and all that they either stay stuck to that one thing, which can be fine, or they start to kind of evolve and they start to realize, hey, this is what I liked from what I did before and this is this is what I still like and this is what I want to, you know, keep experimenting with and seeing what mm -hmm. I can do and stuff like that. And I guess for me in my career, because, you know, unlike Mike, who's been in for 23 years, this is really only like my 10th year that I've been in film. You know, Comatose Mother was really my first narrative um, piece. Yeah. And, you know, coming back to though Drag Me to Hell, I guess some of it comes down to the to the formative years of just being a kid, you know? Um, I was an 80s kid, and, and you know, some of my favorite films were Ghostbusters and Gremlins. And yeah. I, when you're a kid, you don't, maybe you do, but you don't really realize that those are funny. <laughs> you know what I mean? That yeah. there's a sense of humor in them. Yeah, yeah I definitely did. I you definitely, know, yeah. like, and, and another one I loved was Poltergeist. And, and that was... As far as horror went for a kid, that's about what I had. You know, that that yeah. wasn't, you know, it was a different period. I, I wasn't, I, I was raised in a household that liked movies, that liked MTV and stuff like that. But we didn't, we didn't have this massive VHS collection of movies and we didn't have all that, you know. And we, we didn't necessarily go to the movies all the time either. Like now my family goes like all the time, all the time. But, you know, just for whatever it was, it just wasn't something that they totally did. And... Um, so I remember I had this friend that I played baseball with and we'd always like hang out and watch movies and stuff and he brought by Army of Darkness. <laughs> and wow. so I didn't see any of the Evil Deads or anything like that, <laughs> right, at this point. And so he brings by Army of Darkness and, you know, we were a little stricter at the time when I was a kid, like, oh, that's like an R-rated movie. No, 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 it's okay, it's okay, you know what I mean, stuff like that. And uh, that was, <laughs> I actually have to laugh. <laughs> Army of Darkness is probably like the film that started like opening the watershed of like, we started watching R-rated movies and stuff in the house and all that uh. sort of thing, right? Like, I think like the, the hardest R we had was Predator, like as far as things went, right? And so okay. that's just that's just how things, you know, evolved. And, um, and, uh, and so you started coming in and, because um, my parents were more conservative and things like that, right? And so that was uh -huh. part of the reason why. 
And uh, so we loved Army of Darkness, just loved it, right? And so I ended up watching the whole Evil Dead trilogy in reverse. Army of Darkness, then Evil Dead 2, then Evil Dead, right? It was wow. how it kind of happened. Okay. And so that starts to kind of inform you a little bit more and more. Um, and, and then, you know, so, you know, flash forward to 2009 when, yeah, Drag Me to Hell comes out. 2009 or 2008, one of the two. Yeah. Um, I think 2009. I, I remember I didn't even really like really want to see it. Yeah, I didn't even like really want to see it. I wanted to see it, but I wasn't like I, for whatever reason, just and I write this in the book, it wasn't like blowing my skirt up, right? Like, but I went and saw it and I freaking loved it. It was like one of the best theatrical experiences I've ever had. Yeah. Oh, um, I, I I had that too when I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, like the audience was really into it. It wasn't a huge audience, and it was just like it was just so much fun. And so when I started developing Comatose Mother, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted it to be right out the bat, but as I, as I first got that first draft in and started going from there, and I realized that it was really, there was so much macabre humor and this kind of over-the-topness to it, even in the title itself, you know, and you start developing it, I remember the, the one film I told everybody in the crew to watch before they came was Drive Me to Hell. I was like, this okay. is the spirit, this is the tone we're kind of going for while we're still doing our own thing. And, you know, and then things evolve from there. And, uh, but for me, I guess it told me, hey, especially with Army of Darkness and just loving Raimi films in general, um, that's why it was so odd. I didn't really, you know, <laughs> like care, like I wasn't that hyped to see it. Um, you know, you don't realize that it's informing you and educating you and giving you these influences until you're finally there, right? And. And then to just round it out with that, and now I realize, like, oh, I, I guess I like Guillermo del Toro films way more than I realized I did because as things have evolved and my works have kind of come in with that really kind of rich palette and monsters and stuff like that, yes. with some gallows humor and stuff like that that sometimes creeps up into it, um, you start to realize these artists that inform you and all that. But yeah, I think my entry into horror, as I've just mentioned all those, I mean, they all are comedic except for maybe poltergeist on many levels you know so yeah yeah and so and so mike uh with the evil dead 2 how how did that start it, i mean what is is that like the 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 first time you really loved horror or was it uh something that happened later after you had already loved horror and how has it like really influenced you as a filmmaker well you know the, the thing that's funny is, is uh and I have an Army of Darkness story as well because, again, it's a it's a very influential film and you know it's life changing. I feel, uh, but uh, you know, I, I had a, a strange upbringing because my my parents got who were super religious and Catholic, but my dad was a movie lover, huh. and I, I think it comes from just being cheap that that uh, you know he was okay with going to three dollar matinees, um, you know, and seeing whatever was playing, and yeah. so uh, so so we would see. All sorts of things I talk about often, like, and I don't, I don't mean first movie memories. What my first memories, period, uh, are The Hills Have Eyes. I was three, uh, and really? I remember seeing the 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 canary being crushed in the blood, and that that's just you know that that leaves an impact when you're a child. Also saw Carrie when I was around that age too, uh, wow. and um, so horror was was really a, a big thing for me growing up. Uh, particularly uh, monster movies. Uh, so I, I loved my, my favorite movies as a kid were uh, The Howling and uh, and uh, uh, American Werewolf in London. I thought like, you know, werewolf movies were the coolest movies, period. Like, you know, if it was yeah. a werewolf movie, it was amazing. I think we were just lucky in the 80s because we haven't gotten many since. But back then we just had that little, like, you know, group of them. Uh, but uh, so I loved horror. And then Evil Dead 2 is actually amazing. And I can't believe that this is true is I don't think I was ready for it like I didn't I didn't really react to it the first time because I think it's when you're seeing a piece of genius like that you, you, my, my young mind didn't really know how to because it was like this isn't a horror movie you know it's like wait I don't <laughs> understand this is goofy uh, and, and I didn't quite yeah I didn't know how I felt about it at first and then and then um, I'd say it was in high school and it was through cable that it was playing all the time and then it became an addiction Oh yeah, it's a cave that you that you watched with your friends, and then uh, I also I think it was a very formative time when I saw it um, because and I saw Evil Dead One in the theater too, so which is 1980. So really? that made yeah. seven. 
Um, you know, uh, and I saw Evil Dead 2 in the theater, but again, uh, but yeah, it, it was a thing that my friends and I, uh, all shared, you know, a love for the, this incredible movie. Uh, yeah. and, and, um, you know, and, and it served as a, as a bit of a film school because he's so inventive with the camera, uh, you know, between the, the shaky cam and, you know, being on the roof and, you know, stop motion and all that stuff, you know, it was really for, and, and he comes very much. For, you know, I mean, Raimi is kind of one of those ultimate indie filmmakers, at least certainly starting out. You know, he started with nothing. He started with, you know, just a group of his friends and, you know, making movies. And there's so there's something very relatable uh, about his filmmaking that yeah. speaks to us, you know, as as filmmakers that want to be filmmakers. Is there is something that I understand that. And so um, so able to too throughout high school became, you know, like like just the thing. It became my film school. Watched it hundreds of times. And then there was the announcement that he was working on the Medieval Dead, a.k.a. Army of Darkness. And uh -huh. I, I don't, I mean, you know, as excited as we were for a new Star Wars movie, as excited as we are for, you know, a new Bill and Ted, whatever, whatever your, your thing is, nothing compared to the excitement that a new Evil Dead movie was coming, you know, uh. and, and oh, oh my God, I mean, that was, you know, I would read everything about it, I would, you know, and it was like this epic um, independent film because it, even though it was a studio, it was still made for like like twelve million dollars or something like that, and it was non-union. And you'd hear the stuff about, uh, you know, there was picketing and and the unions were trying to flip them or whatever, but they uh. were still making this crazy movie. And then um, I saw it in a very interesting way. I have a lot of stories about seeing Army of Darkness actually. Uh, back when I was in college. Um, I went to Pasadena City College, uh, you know, uh, and and over there, that's when they were where they were doing a lot of test screenings, uh, mm -hmm. and so I saw a lot of really great movies uh, back then in test screening form. A lot of Wes Craven stuff, a lot of People Under the Stairs, uh, and uh, New Nightmare and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, that that's how I would see them. Uh, and then um, you know came the came the day when when I got uh, the the test screening thing of like, would you like to see this movie called army of darkness? And it was like, Oh, oh my God. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> this is unbelievable. And, and so I really kind of got to uh, more than probably any movie ever got to follow it, you know, through magazines, through before social media, of course, um, you know, talking with friends, uh, knowing people that had worked on it and just getting every scoop and then going to, and I don't even think I'm exaggerating about every test screening that they had for it. It was not a well-liked movie at the studio. They didn't know what the fuck to do with it. So they had something like five or six test screenings, and I went to at least three of them. I would always go up to Raimi afterwards and tell him what a, what a fan I was and, and how much you know I loved the film or whatever. And it was wow. interesting to see it constantly change slightly of like, oh, Duke Henry the Red comes here, and that's how the movie ends. Uh, there was an alternate ending uh, that does you can find mm -hmm. on the Blu-ray now, but doesn't it doesn't didn't exist uh, in the final form. And then when the movie came out, you know, I'd heard there was a new ending, so it was a whole other reason to see it. And so I got all my friends together, and it, like an idiot, I just thought that it was going to be you know Titanic. It was going to be the Avengers movie. I thought there was going to be lines around the block because who wouldn't want to go see the most amazing movie ever? Like <laughs> Army of Darkness coming out. Like why? Why are why are there not pre-sales? Why you know? And so I, I made my friends like I'm an idiot. Get an go there an hour and a half early. To, it's like <laughs> we got to get a flight. You don't understand? It's opening night of Army of Darkness. Uh, and uh, and we were the only ones there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was completely empty uh and it was still an amazing experience you know even though there was literally about 15 other people in a very huge hollywood theater uh and yeah and then um you know and, and i grew to love that and then obviously much like evil dead you watch that over and over again once it, it came yeah. to VHS. but i watched six times in its theatrical run admittedly some of them were in the pre-screenings but it only it only was in theater for two weeks so <laughs> so oh. uh, Really? And this is like the early '90s. It's in the yeah. theaters for only two yeah. weeks, but everything was there like longer, right? Way so it's longer. like, I, yeah, totally. I think uh, yeah, by the second or third week or whatever, yeah, I think it was the second week. It was already in the dollar theaters. Uh, you know, it just <laughs> oh, came out wow. all yeah. the dollar theaters, and then I went to see it there a bunch of times. You know, it's so. Yeah. Uh, what is it about horror comedies? You know, I know that both of you guys are 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 really influenced by horror comedies and you and myself is included uh what is it about horror comedies that makes it so fun uh mike we'll start with you like what 
what is it that makes it so fun and what really makes a good horror comedy? I, I, I mean, it's one of those things, like Jonathan was talking about, like, I, I can't, you know, you're sort of like, it's sort of your voice, right? It's it's sort of like, you know, it's sort of something that inherently you, you were just drawn to. Because I don't think anyone plans on, man, I want to make horror comedy. Uh, and, and for myself, it's like I can't. And, and believe me, it's been, a, it's been an, an impediment in my career. Mm. You know, some of us don't want to make straight horror movies. Some of us like blood in the face and want to laugh and want, want that experience. Because yeah. it's such a, more than anything, and I think this is what makes it such a special thing. It's the best theatrical experience. Like you're talking about with Drag Me to Hell when, when yep. you saw it. It's just like there's nothing like that. That mixture of, of, of comedy and horror because the audience is constantly, you're constantly getting reactions. You're either getting laughter, or you're getting screams, or you're getting jumps, and then you're getting laughter. And and it's, it's, and it's weird. I mean, even though this doesn't necessarily count as a horror comedy, and this is... I, what, I'm sure one of the only people that has ever said this. Um, one of the most influential films that made me want to become a filmmaker was Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, because oh. I saw, uh, I know, which is not regarded as one of the better ones, but, uh, you know, but the idea of Carrie versus Jason. Um, and I thought it was going to be stupid. I didn't really care, but I went to see it uh, back when I was a, a kid, like a little kid. Um, the, 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 the best places in la to see a movie was westwood because that's where the college kids would go on the on the weekends uh and uh, that's where like the best theaters in la were this is long before the arc light you know you had the chinese which yeah. was a little dumpy back then to be honest uh and yeah. uh but westwood had had the you know the bruin and all these theaters and so so i went to see uh friday the 13th part 7 opening night on a friday uh with a sold out westwood audience uh, college kids oh, so wow. everyone's like 19 or 20 I mean, electric. I mean, just life changing. Uh, I, I've never seen an audience erupt like that. Erupt in cheers, erupt in laughter, erupt in applause. You know, and it was just so like, I want to do this. I want to make audiences do that. Uh, and uh, yeah. and yeah, it kind of it kind of changed me. So that that's my really? take on what what makes a good horror comedy. One thing I wanted to say, you know, about Evil Dead. And why those some of those films work really well, but in particular Army of Darkness, Evil Dead, they have really short run times. It really yeah. makes those films digestible. Yeah. Like it's just like, boom. I mean, it's not uncommon to do like if you're in the mood for more of a comedy uh, feel to it, you know, to do an Army Darkness and Evil Dead Two, you know, double feature right there, and it's not even three hours. You know, <laughs> like yeah. you just you zip right through those things. I, I mean, what's the runtime on Evil Dead 2? Isn't it like 79 minutes or something yeah, like that? They're short. I mean, yeah, horror yeah. comics tend to be like, you know, in the 80 minute, you know, range or whatever. Yeah, and, and that's something I kind of wanted to chime in is like, there's this digestible factor to them that even if they're not that great, they're gonna, they're, they're pretty quick, you know? Like, you could get right through them and kind of enjoy them for what they are. But, um, you know, I think we were talking about what was making horror comedies work? Like, what's that formula or something like that? Am I right? Is that where we left off with it? Right? Yeah, I think yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. So where we're, where we're going is, um, you know, I think as I, and I wrote this in the book, in the essay is I, I, I kind of compare them as these cosmic lovers that are like just destined to be together, horror and comedy. Oh. Like they just, there's this relationship that shouldn't work that works, you know? And, yeah. and I think a big reason for it is, it's your it's that stimulation that you're always getting you know um especially when a horror comedy it knows what it is whether it's that wink nudge or that something that's over the top you know something that's been fascinating for me to watch um because i don't think there's been a lot of horror comedy in the last decade like on the whole like there just was, isn't period the independent no. the independent yeah. 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 yeah and and you you're just not seeing it and so what happened was you know, my first short, Comatose Mother, which has very strong horror comedy elements in it. Uh, it's really more of a romp than anything. Um, as far as, it's like a horror romp. If I and were Mike, to, if I, you I, haven't seen this movie yet, it, it was the most awarded uh, horror short film of all time. Of for like wow. five years. Congrats. Yeah, for about five years. Thank you, thank you. I mean, yeah. there's definitely things I would That's do awesome. different now. You know? <laughs> there's yeah. definitely uh, modifications I would make um, as far as it goes. I would definitely make it tighter. But... Um, you know, it's a Screamfest channel, just put it on their YouTube about six weeks ago or so. Oh. And what's interesting is to watch the reactions that were initially coming in. You can see that there's a generation of people who j they just didn't get it. 
Oh, they, wow. yeah. In the comments, you can just see that they're like, I don't get it. <laughs> Do you feel that's that's newer newer kids or is oh, that yeah. okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because then you'd see people start to chime in. And so, like, its momentum really was interesting watching it flow. Like, it took it a while to build up momentum in terms of people actually liking it. Right. Uh, like, the audiences. Like, initially, it was like, you know, it, it was just, it was a slow build to people, like, being like, no, I get it. This is cool. Like, people, it's audience being discovered. Because generally speaking, on YouTube's audience now, you are looking at teenagers and maybe people in their late teens and early 20s or even 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds who just haven't seen this stuff. So it's like really bizarre for them. And seeing yeah. it in their comments, like they're like, like, I don't get it. Why is it funny? Or like, this is stupid. It's funny. You know, this isn't scary. Yeah. But then yeah. people are like, no, it is scary, but it's also funny. And it, it's interesting to see that dialogue. But, but coming back to it, um, but like I said, it, it's picked up is... Um, you're you're constantly releasing the tension, and again, there's an audience factor that comes into it that you get that theatrically, and um, and again, my my brother who's younger than me, I remember showing Drag Me to Hell to his friends for like a movie night, you know, good six seven years ago, yeah. and they thought it was like the stupidest thing they had ever yeah. seen, and yeah. then they kind of watched it again, and then they started realizing how awesome it was. Yeah, yep. so that was my experience with Evil Dead too. You know, yeah. I mean, very similarly. Yeah. But my my girlfriend, uh, you know, before we met, she had watched Drag Me to Hell. And I, I when we you know, started dating, I'm like, yeah, Drag Me to Hell, one of my favorite movies. Uh, and she was like, that movie's so stupid, blah, blah, blah. And so it's, it kind of, you know, it, it, some people just don't, don't get it. And some people do get it. And, you know, you yeah, can't. It's a vibe. And, you know. We get it. Yeah, we get we it. Get it. And, we're the cool and back to, It's that tension, right? Like horror works on a international level so well because scary is scary anywhere you go, right? Yeah. Well, comedy definitely has some cultural things, but I think uh, that are tied to it. But I think there's something when comedy is tied to horror, it crosses international boundaries right. in a way that general comedy doesn't. And I, I, I'm not a scientist. I couldn't tell you the chemical reactions that are going on or the cultural things in an anthropology way that, that makes that happen. But it's, it's, it's the reason why, like, the host works, right? Like, internationally. Um, yeah. You know, like, it, it, there's a reason that these things, they have this kind of thing. And maybe it's a slapsticky ness that comes with it or whatnot. But, but what I'm getting at is um, it's the easing of the tension. You know, I'm not going to lie. So I saw Midsummer the other night. It's streaming for free on a Amazon. And have you guys seen it? We yeah. have. I have. Yep. Okay. I fl I laughed out loud, and I know it's totally unintentionally like, <laughs> during the orgy scene. And ah. I was like, or not the orgy, but during. No, the but I, I think that I think scene. that's that's appropriate to laugh there. I don't I don't think Ari Aster would be like, oh my god, he laughed during that because. You know, started, but I don't know. You know what I mean? stuff. Yeah, I, I think it's so over the top. It's like wow, okay. Like yeah. I just I, I, it was just like there was something that happened, and then there was a few moments, and I was like, okay, like. I don't know if this is supposed to be funny right well, now. That's because you're still a virgin, Jonathan. That's, oh, that's, that's, oh, <laughs> you're not oh, used to that. seeing that there kind of stuff. Is. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, I'm with that. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see. No comment. Uh, a gentleman doesn't talk about such salacious activity, my friend. Never. Yes, never, never. A gentleman never tells. You definitely don't kiss or tell. So uh, you will never know who I've kissed or told until I do it in front of you. But, you know, <laughs> coming back to it is, uh, uh, no, no, no. But, you know, but at the same time, you know, there's these romps that come with it. And you just, it's that, again, I, I think I've said it already, but it's that easing of tension, right? Like, I think some people struggle with really dark and intense horror films. And I think there's, there's a place for all types of horror, right? But some audiences really do struggle with that, like they might struggle with a horror comedy, um, because it's just it's this unrelenting tension and pressure, and it's just it makes you feel a certain way that some people don't like and they don't want. Um, while horror comedy, it 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 eases it. You get scared and then you're laughing, and it yeah. eases that tension, and then you come back again. So there's almost like it's almost like a safety net, right? Like that you could come in and it allows your, you to dip your toes into horror 
and and become more and more exposed to it. And yeah. and so I'm saying that I think horror comedy is a fantastic form of introductory horror. Yeah, so, that's kind of how how it was for me uh, with Ghostbusters and Gremlins, and probably all three of us in in the eighties and seeing those movies in the theaters. Uh, that that was the the most tremendous thing on earth, uh, and then eventually going, wait a second, uh, Freddy Krueger is funny. I can I can do this. All right, I, yeah, I can watch all these horror movies. Let me keep going darker and darker, and then you you know you get into the into the crazier shit. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, I, New I think, York Ripper, and you know, and then, then it's yeah, all then, yeah. From there, you know? <laughs> yeah, Tenebrae, <laughs> and you know, you're, you're just slashing <laughs> open shirts and stuff, but. Yeah, I mean, especially that's why it's good. Like movies like Monster House and Monster Squad, uh, they're great introductions to horror for kids. Um, but, but here's the, the the downside of this is unfortunate, and, and I and I wish this wasn't true. Uh, they don't do well because yeah. because people don't get them. And and I I say this from a place of experience who's tried to make many horror comedies and always. Uh, you know, it's every once in a blue moon I squeak one through, but yep. but most of the time I met with well these aren't selling. This isn't what people want to see. I think uh, Shaun of the Dead being one of the only exceptions, which was not a blockbuster by any means. It's just that it did yep. fine. You know, Zombieland. Uh, yeah, uh, Z- Zombie Land is a legit like crossover. That is a legit horror yeah. comedy that actually did well. Uh, but most of them don't, you know, the the cabin in the woods or, you know, or drag me to hell, you know, it, yeah. it, and that's what you're constantly up against is that, unfortunately, more often than not, people go, what the hell is this? This isn't scary. You know what? As you're saying that, what's interesting is I was mentioning to Christian earlier in the show that I've been building these uh, pitch decks and stuff, getting that ready right now. And I actually went through like the whole box office breakdown of I think horror comedies in like the last uh, twenty years or something like that. So right. while that's going on, and I could tell you some interesting facts that I found yeah. about that, but I have, to, I have to pull that up in just a moment. You're gonna have to give yeah. me a moment to find the deck that I right. put that into. But um, but you're right actually about that. In fact, I'll tell you, I I've got a feature version of Comatose Mother that I've got kind of out there, and there was. There was, I won't get into the whole story where it literally was on the brink of happening, um, but uh, it didn't. Um, but as it turned out, a friend of mine gave it, and I don't, I'll leave the, uh, I'll leave the comment, I'll leave your own thoughts to you about what it means, but this friend of mine, who was a development executive, um, got it to a blacklist reader, and they came back with this comment like, I don't get it. It's scary, and then it's funny. <laughs> What's right, its tone? Uh, and I'm like, you read for the blacklist, dude, and yeah. you can't get tone. It, it's weird how the disconnect happens, and I don't, I don't get it. And and like you were talking about, like you know, looking at the reactions of your film of why the kids don't get it. We made Tales of Halloween, and that was very much you know like-minded people getting together to make an anthology thing. And what was fascinating and really fascinating to me is that when you give you know, 10 horror filmmakers, and maybe it's particular to those filmmakers, who knows, when you give them carte blanche of what to do, most of us went comedy for whatever reason. And never did we think, never did it occur to us what, how other people were going to perceive this movie. All we cared about was entertaining each other, you know, and and entertaining our friends, who we all knew were like-minded people. So, you know, we filled it with every you know, every person that we could get in, in there, whether it was Stuart Gordon or Barry Bostwick or, you know, who, uh, Felissa Rose, whoever, whatever horror people, Adrian Barbeau, we, you know, because we made a fan film, essentially a giant fan film. Yeah. And then we get the reviews from kids going, uh, what the fuck is this? You know, like this <laughs> is the fuck scary. All these right. And the thing is because we kind of transcended it to a certain degree, because it's, I, I, I mean, what I mean by that is saying that, because we weren't trying to scare each other because we have seen all the scary movies and we thought like, okay, well let's have fun with the scary movies and let's do something that is, that is fun uh, using the language of scary movies. Uh, And that, that's just because we've kind of so, so deeply entrenched in it that it wasn't interesting uh, to do something that is typical. You know, we want to do something that that's just fun, but you know, tell that to a 14 year old girl that's having a sleepover party. Why the hell she's not scared and why there's yeah. all this blood and silliness, they don't get it. They're just like, so your movie's broken, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, when you come back to it, a lot of people forget that the horror comedy goes back 
generations. I mean, you've got the Abbott and Costello meet the Wolfman, right? Like you, yeah. you, this is a genre that has existed for a really long time and did very well, you know, like, with, oh, yeah. and, and, may, and maybe that's the secret. Maybe that's the secret sauce we're all ignoring. <laughs> no, no comedian. Yeah. No, like we don't have like a major, like, you know, comedic act or like a major star known for comedy. Like we're not Hart. having heart into this comedies, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Me, this thing. I mean, maybe we just landed on like a hundred million dollar idea right here, where we yeah. don't have Kevin Hart starring and Kevin Hart meets the Wolfman. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like maybe that's what we need to do. Yeah, yeah. And that's. I guess that's, that's what the Medea movies are about. You know, and that's where I'm going to bring up. I found my book here, right? So it was, I believe, 19 or 20 films that I listed from between 2009 and 2019, and and to give you a pref uh, a, a uh, preface to this, I could only use films that, um, and I only had so much per page that I could fill, but I could only use films that had a reported budget and reported box office numbers, right? So okay. I couldn't do everything that was out there as yeah. far as it goes. So of like the 20 films, what's interesting is that I had here only five lost money at the box office. That doesn't count P&A or anything like that. Um, but these, of course, includes films like Zombieland, Double Tap, Goosebumps 2, Boo, Boo 2, the new Ghostbusters, actually. Goosebumps. Again, a lot of these are PG-13 comedies, Dark Shadows, Cabin in the Woods, of course. Uh, Fright Night gets categorized as kind of a little bit of a horror comedy. There's definitely campiness in there. The, the new one or the old one? Are you talking the new about? one. The new yeah, one. The new this one. goes back to 2009. And again, some of these barely cross the threshold, but only five of these 20 actually didn't break even at the box office. The rest at least made their budget back at the box office. But I do notice from a lot of the ones you're mentioning that they, they kind of are geared towards kids, which is kind yes. of a little bit of a different, you know, the kind of Monsters, Inc., Monsters, ha Monster House kind of thing. Yeah. It's slightly different than, you know, than... Yeah. Well, I would know. concur. I would concur. I mean, Dark Shadows is on here. I mean, people consider that a failure. I don't know how much they put in the P&A, but that thing made $245 million worldwide. I don't know. I thought, I thought it was a bomb. Yeah, yeah. actually, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, that actually, and probably with DVD sales, I, I mean, Hollywood accounting, right, guys? Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like, they're like, well, we were expecting $500 million with Johnny Depp, right? Because we paid him 50 But right. at the same time, you know, even Tucker and Dale versus Evil had a $5 million budget and made $5.2 worldwide at the box office, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. How um, did that thing have a $5 million budget? I'm I'm very curious about that. Where'd one. that money that go? One, that one is is I, and again, you always have to question the reporting. That one is sort of notorious because it didn't come out for a long time because the investors said, "Well, we're not. We, we put in five million dollars for this. We're not selling it for two million dollars," and so uh, they wouldn't release it until finally they had to. But I was under the impression they did. They never got their five million dollars back. But, but yeah, I, I mean, I got these numbers. There's really only two sources, right? Box yeah. Well, office. you're not going to get your five million no. back if you only no. make five million. You spend five million. So right, right. And who knows what it's doing with everything else? But these are the numbers that we had. I mean, even the movie Vampire Suck, which right, I, I yeah, even know what it was. That was a twenty million dollar budget in 2010. No, it made way. eighty million worldwide. Wow. 80 million. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I mean, but again, uh, yeah, like those are definitely a little bit more campy, a little bit more tween audience and stuff like that. But we do have Krampus that was a $15 million budget, and it made $61 million worldwide. I think, but, I think the ones uh, that, that I can't, and this is uh, you know, largely because of the type of stuff that I try to get made, what, what, uh, what I can't ever seem to break through is anything that is gory. You know, I think Cabin in the Woods, out of the list you mentioned, is the only one that's like, okay, well, the Cabin in the Woods, I could work with that. And that did okay. That broke even. Yeah. I mean, it didn't do amazing, yeah. but it did okay, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. But but people seem to, like, you can do monsters and kids and stuff like that is fine, but it seems like the moment, you you know, heads explode or there's decapitations, that's where people seem to, like, ah, you know, to, to lose people, it. Yeah, and maybe people are like, maybe it's a more woke culture. Maybe people are just like, no, like, I don't watch that with my... Well, well I, I have, I have hope. I I, I've always had hope, and maybe this is where, you know, it, it's going to take you or I to, to do it, or I don't know. But I've always hoped that it's, it just takes one movie to kind of change that, you know, to kind of break through and be that breakout hit that, that you know, kind of goes, oh, this is cool. Well, you know? yeah. I mean, you know, there was a really cool film. Like, I was actually surprised by how campy it was, was... Um, Oh my gosh, I'm already forgetting the title. It was produced by Guillermo with the Tooth Fairy uh, creatures. Um, oh, is it uh, Don't, uh, don't be, be Afraid of the Dark? dark? Yeah, Don't oh, Be Afraid yeah. of the Dark. And I was surprised. I remember watching it. I was like, that was like the opening scene. I was like, that was actually really campy. Like when the guy gets ripped down into like, 
the uh, the furnace by the tooth fairy creatures. Yeah. I was like, that was that was actually really humorous. And like, well, the whole film wasn't there, but I'm with you. And you know, and we talked about the evolution of being a filmmaker. And and you know, I mentioned the Guillermo del Toro thing. I think that's where I've kind of evolved a little bit as in terms of my. I've definitely evolved a little bit more into the macabre, right? Mm -hmm. Than straight up over the top, even though there's still that yeah. element there. But right. I've definitely kind of gravitated to that the macabre as far as it goes, and that kind of more gallows humor as far as it goes, which was still there. But um, but that's where you know a little bit more of a wry sense of humor as far as it goes. But that's I guess where I've kind of gone on this little tangent here. Uh, especially with what you're talking about, Mike, with like sales agents. I think that's such BS where they're like, oh, it doesn't oh, it sell sucks. it. Oh, believe yeah. me, there's so many projects like, that I've wanted to make over the years, but I'm all, I always, that and Westerns, those are the two. Yeah. And, and I have a horror comedy Western, so believe me, that's just never going to happen. The <laughs> uh, <laughs> thing about that is, and I, 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 I won't say the company that I was, I was kind of alluding to this uh, maybe after the, the podcast because I don't want to give away my sources, right? But a pretty prominent distributor out there, flat out, we had lunch back in about November, and he was telling me, he goes straight up to me, he's like, he's like, you know what we really need? And if you have it right now, we'll start making a deal. He wow. goes, we need Westerns. Oh, wow. Okay. And I go, what? like, okay, now they're looking more for straight Westerns, right? right? Like, just more there. But he did tell me, we had a phone call a couple of weeks ago, this comes back to what we were talking about earlier in the show, Christian, where he flat out said, Generally, the crossovers don't do well when it comes to the westerns. But in this landscape right now, we might be looking. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Okay. And That's so, your chance, Mike. Yeah, I know. So, I have a horror western. I've always yeah, wanted to take. Yeah. I, I just wrote one. You know, I was just telling Christian this. And and but why why they know is like, look, it's not going to blow the roof off. But they know with their model, look, we know that we're going to make X amount of dollars off of it because it fills this need in the marketplace. They're not going to make like a hundred million off it or anything like that, but they, with where they're at, they can give, they can buy it for five or make it for five or whatever that is. And they know that they're going to probably make like 10, right? But that's enough for them to justify doing something sure. like that, right? Yeah, to satisfy sure. that marketplace need. And so it's, it's interesting. And I think coming back again to what we're talking about, and I think this is maybe where things is, I honestly think, and again, I'm not getting a green light right now on something, but I do think we're going to see a desperation. They need content. They're right, going. Right. They're already feeling the stretch. Believe me, they are. And it's going to be worse here in a few months, and especially if we're shut down from any kind of major film production for the next six months or even a year. Who knows, right? And they're all going to need horror comedies. That's they're going to need horror comedies. They're going to yep. need all this to satisfy, especially things that they made lower budget. And, and you know, coming back to it, like, I think you might be getting a lot of people who are just going to be like, just <laughs> throwing shit on the wall and just see right, what's sure. You know, yeah. like, and so on that level, I think there could be some excitement to be had because I think there's, there's some opportunity. Well, we're entering a different world. Whatever yeah. other side yeah. of this pandemic is going to be, we're going to be entering a whole new landscape here because, you know, theatrical films as we grew up with are, I don't want to say dead, but, you know, but it was already going that way. But it's going to be reserved for Marvel films and whatever big budget tentpole things. And that's it, you know. And then yeah. other than that, it's just going to be a world of streaming and well, VOD. So, you know, you hopefully... Know opportunities come from that oh, yeah. as a and honestly though and and this is if i was if i was if i had a crystal ball and this is maybe extreme prediction here i know there was the whole fear and there still is the worry of like amazon and disney and these companies owning their own cinemas but in the end and this is just as you're talking there and you know kind of thinking about it maybe maybe that is the savior for cinema in the end. And I say this not to be like, oh, corporate shill or, you know, sellout or something like that. But it's like, but if you really break it down, if these cinemas, like say Disney has a cinema or say Warner has it, right? Or say even Blumhouse has like 20 that they ended up buying up, right? right. Like that could actually end up being the best opportunity to get your films in the cinema because say Disney has their 16 screen megaplex. Well, eight of those screens are your big Marvel films and all that, but then they supplement it with like three or four or five films that they might have not generally done theatrical that are your lower budget because they have the monopoly on their, you know, their cinema screen, right? Sure. Yeah. And then the others go in. There could be, what I guess I'm saying is there's potentially a silver lining 
in such a scenario that there could actually be something that's beneficial that we're not seeing yet. Uh, hopefully. I mean, the, the idea of Amazon b buying something like AMC, I, I, I actually see being quite likely, you know, just because yeah. they own everything else. Uh, and uh, I don't think anybody wants to see the movie theaters go, you know. Yeah. I mean, that would be very sad to me of like, no, there's not really any movie theaters anymore. That would be, uh, that'd be horrible, right? You know, right. and I, 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 th I think we share that, at least that, that I think most people feel that way. So, so. But, you know, at the same time is when, okay, June 15th, you can all, whatever it is, you can all come back slowly. I, I worry about what the movie theaters are going to look like at that point because no one's going to want to be near each other. Now, of course, that's hopefully just a temporary thing. You know, hopefully, you know, once uh, a year from now, if there's a vaccine and everybody gets it, then, you know, I'm sure everyone will be going out to concerts and fucking in the streets and, you know, God knows <laughs> what, what things uh, will happen. Hey, baby, it's coming. Baby yeah. Boom is coming, guys. It's not sounds now. like a plan. People, people, people thought like a Baby Boom would happen now, but I would, I would, I don't feel these are highly sexual times. Yeah, I don't everybody hates other. each other at this point. Yeah, the divorces are coming. Together. It's going to be coming well, in. Well, it's like it's, there's, there's no online dating. You know, people aren't hooking yeah. up. You know, there's uh, and, and and people that are stuck together. I mean, some of them thankfully like each other, but some don't. You know, so. Yep. Yeah, you got to find your times, explore things. I mean, so, and that, you know, that maybe comes in with a question that we could come in. And we're, we're kind of maybe touching on it is, what is the future for horror comedies? As we've already kind of talked about here, it's already, we're already noticing that there isn't as much as there used to be, obviously. At least major theatrical releases yeah. that are coming in um, to find, you know, kind of the horror comedies. Um that are maybe a little bit more, I don't want to say fringe or underground, but are definitely more independent, like maybe Big Ass Spider or, or Deadheads that, uh, you know, yeah, that came out a few years ago. You have a few of these, these comedies that maybe have to be found and be discovered. Sure. And now we're talking about the cinemas and all that. Like, what do you guys see more as maybe the future landscape for horror comedies? I mean, and I'll just say real quick, I think there's always going to be a market for it. But what is that market? And is there going to be an evolution maybe in the way those t stories are filmed and told? Well, you know, what, what I've noticed at least, and it's been kind of low-key and no one's really paying attention to it, where, where you will find horror comedies is in television. You know, uh, they, they don't always yeah. do great, but between what we do in the shadows... Uh, I, I worked on a show called Stand Against Evil, uh, Ash versus Evil Dead, of course, mm -hmm. uh, is like that. That is kind of where you're seeing the, the stuff we want to see that is gory and is funny uh, and plays with the macabre and, and all that stuff. And so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe, you know, audiences that didn't get it in the theater, you know, because I, I do believe and this is a sort of a theory I have about horror comedy in general is that the, the, the key to it. And I don't want to minimize it to one thing. But one of the most important elements, and I think this was true of Abner Costello meet, meet uh, Frankenstein, uh, is character. You know, is like you if, if you can find, and certainly Tucker and Dale versus Evil and stuff like that. If you yeah. can find characters that you like and you can relate to, well, you'll follow them into that into whatever journey they go to. And if that journey is, you know, zombies, vampires, whatever. Uh, yeah. If you like them and they're funny characters, if it's you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a show that you like, if you like the characters from The Office, but they were in a zombie infestation, you'd watch that show, you know? Uh, and, and so I feel that that's sort of, the key is just finding a show that's funny and has characters you like, and, and hopefully in a set in a horror world, and I feel that that is possible, you know? And those exist to a certain degree. Not there, We're not rampant with them, but, but they're out there. Yeah, so, so it, it just takes uh, the, the right people to, to, to kind of figure out where it needs to go and what kind of audience it is, and it, it's... Uh, it's. I mean, it's an interesting question, but I think you bring up a great point about characters. I mean, Ash, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, there you go. I mean, you go with it with Ash, and even though the first Nightmare on Elm Street was really played more straight, I think some of the hot comedy in there is more unintentional, if I'm being frank, but it yeah. is the first film. Obviously, from then on, though, I mean... <laughs> Freddy is like comedy gold. You know sure. what I mean? oh, yeah. Like he really is, but he's this great character, you know? And for me personally, I'm more in the Freddy camp than I am in the Jason camp. Right. Yep. And so yeah. that's, 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 that's how I am. And, um, and in some ways, I mean, I think maybe nightmare being what it is and being that kind of horror comedy. And obviously Sam Raimi always had that sensibility, but it's being purely speculative. Maybe that gave them a little bit more confidence to go the direction they were going with Evil Dead too. To hey, right, this sure. kind of works and could be mainstream as far as this goes. And and um, 
I don't know, think it, I don't think it. The timing didn't because Nightmare Three didn't come out until eighty seven. So and Evil Dead Two eighty seven. So right, but eighty seven was a good year. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Hell of I mean, a year. I think Predator was eighty seven as well. Like I mean, there was some good stuff yeah. in eighty seven. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, I I go through lists of like you know I was telling a friend like I tell you you know and I don't know if it's because uh, I'm from then but it's just like you know the eighties were just the best time in movies and yeah. then you list the like the the top movies of like eighty four and eighty six eighty seven and they're yeah. all there's just classics it's just so rich in classics and that was oh, the crazy yeah. thing is that I used to see all of them in the theater every, every all those yep. top movies like I'd see them in the theaters and now if you listed the top ten movies now I'm like yeah maybe I saw one of them in the theater. Or maybe it's exactly you know that's a, yeah you know. Uh, you know what's interesting though and maybe th this is definitely something i think maybe you should address in a future podcast here christian is not about like the past horror icons right like we're talking about frankenstein we've talked about freddie we talked about ash but like and and we've kind of alluded to it a little bit where we're seeing maybe the demographic changing a little bit with how they approach uh, horror comedy but with the genre temple characters and these icons that franchises are built around, right? Like, yeah. like being frank, I'm not sure Freddy Krueger and Jason are for a 2020 coming into horror group, right? I think they look at that maybe as, you know, that was for that era and that's something from that era. And, and that's just being speculative because you look at what you don't really see franchise characters anymore in the same way i mean you really had like the heavy hitters the hits well, people that uh, go uh, ahead a, a couple things but you know and who knows and, and you're probably right but but the one thing that surprised me and this surprised the hell out of me yeah. uh halloween 2018 was massive like was yeah. the yeah. biggest hit ever you know of it of that franchise and so that that kind of makes you think that that like true maybe true. maybe our guys have a little little magic left into them the problem is that there was just so many producers on those movies um, in the 80s that the rights are just difficult. <laughs> and so I, yeah, I remember yeah. going in to pitch uh, a Friday the 13th sequel uh, to, to when it was at Platinum Dunes, which, thank God, it's not there anymore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, they had said, you know, with the amount of producers, with the amount of P&A, with just studio overhead, to make a $20 million Friday the 13th movie. Actually, no, it was less than that. I think it was like, a, like a, to make a 10, 10 or $12 million Friday the 13th movie, They and I don't understand the math, so you'll have to bear with me, uh, mm -hmm. they'd have to make something like 80 theatrically to consider it a hit. Wow. Uh, and, and when you're, and, and that's sort of the problem is that there's so much baggage with well, these characters yeah. that we can't just, you know, like back in the day, back in the 80s, you make them for three, four million dollars, you pump them out every year. But yeah. you can't yeah. do One that. company owned well, it and that was it. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example because, again, coming back to these mysterious conversations I'm having. So I was talking to these casting directors a uh, couple months ago. We're talking like four or five months ago before any of this hit. And uh, she, one in particular, she actually emailed me it uh, just to show like why it wasn't going to happen. She like got the breakdown for some reason. And it was a horror film that came out last year um, that I don't know if they casted, but somehow they had some sort of connection to but they just said, and I won't say the name because I don't want to give up anything, but it was a film that came out last year okay. from a major company. And it did fine, like box office wise. But they knew after the first weekend that they weren't doing a sequel. Like oh, right after good. the first weekend, they just knew. Right. Even though it like, made profit and all that, they were like, no, for it to justify a sequel, it needed to do this. Yeah. And, and it didn't. And so we're not doing a sequel from it. But hey, everybody, you know, we made money, cool, but that's we're not going further than this. You know what I mean? <laughs> and... Maybe you're right, and maybe with the new model of things, uh, whether it be you know corporate-owned theaters or streaming, maybe we can get more of this because if if it is just going to Netflix and stuff like that, the P and A is out of Exclusives, it. Exclusives, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because now, like you said, like if we can, and that was something I was just reading. The P and A for, that is one follow-up from what actually could be a benefit. Let's be right. honest. Sure. Is they're going to have to cut a lot of P and A expenditures on films coming out in the future, um, as far as this things. I mean, speaking of horror it's not right i mean it is but it isn't like the new scooby-doo animated film is now going vod yeah, right so it's like, really? yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah they I'm excited about it's called that. scoob i think right? it's scoob right i'm yeah. all over that i'm thrilled about that yeah, yeah yeah so that's going vod and, and you know these are the things to look at with the model as far as it goes and like the cost expenditures. So obviously this is if anything obviously with this whole environment <laughs> i know that we're going to go in this way we'll bring it back to horror comedy but it's we all have to start really 
thinking with a business brain, right? As filmmakers, if we aren't already, yeah. we really have to start really pushing that and 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 getting savvy ourselves. Because yes, there's going to be the sales agents and there's going to be the distributors and the people that are in this position. But we need to put ourselves in a position moving forward where we say like, no, that's bull. And I can give you the numbers to show you why, because I've done that. Because a lot of that comes from us not knowing why they right. can throw this kind of smoke and mirrors. They're assuming we don't know and that we don't know the model and what the numbers are going behind this. A lot of them are, right? They're like, well, I got my accounting degree, but I'm going to green light your movie, right? Type of a thing, right? I don't know anything about story, but I got my accounting degree, you know, like as far as it goes. But like, I think what we have to do is, you know, in our sort of skill set and our package, um, uh, we got a package to show you, <laughs> Platinum Dunes. Um, no, but, uh, but when it comes back to it, I think if we can kind of just make ourselves a little more savvy with this and spend this time to kind of go with that and be like, no, this is what the ROI is. These are the projections and I can show that based off of this and based on my tracker or whatever it is that we got to show, you know, just kind of take a little bit of the power in that way. Um, so that you yeah. have that ammunition going forward. But, you know, uh, come back to, to horror comedy. I know we've really touched on um, specific films, uh, really, as far as it goes. I mean, what are some of maybe the, the gems that, I, I, and honestly, I know that we're like talking here. I don't know how long we're going to go. I mean, I got to guess. Yeah, here. yeah. I was just about to wrap yeah. it up. But I mean, maybe we could end. Well, we could we could end it with our like favorite horror comedies. I'm sure, yeah. uh, you know, or maybe yeah. like a gem that's like under like the radar that maybe not a lot of people know about or something like that, right? Okay, uh, oh, quick answer. One, uh, one title answer, Mike. What's your your horror well, comedy? Yeah, but, I mean, I, I think you know. I mean, that's probably going to do uh, say something that's probably well known. It isn't like I got to think about that. But but Dead Alive is is one that I feel uh, is uh, is. Uh, uh. The greatest, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, unbelievable. I think that's great. Yeah. And Dead Alive, not to get, I know you say quick and stuff like that, but what's so interesting about Dead Alive is, I mean, how, even though it's comedic, he really plays like this straight romance in many ways at like, at right. the first like 30 minutes of the film. Like he really doesn't bring the just straight up horror right. until, you know, the grand finale where it's just, you know, over there. I mean, it's, it's, it's still ridiculous in the end. Yeah, though. yeah, it is. It's still ridiculous, but he does have this, this different manic energy to it. You know, what comes to mind, and I'm sure if I had more time, not, you know, to answer my own question, I remember this film that I rented on VHS and it just looked ridiculous when I was like a 10 year old kid. And it was a trauma film I came to find out because I was actually thinking yeah. about this just a few days ago. It's called Monster in the Closet. Oh yeah, Monster in the Closet. You know what I'm about? Closets, yeah. yeah, and it's totally yeah. like this campy horror comedy, like trauma yeah. style. And I would recommend picking that up because uh, the monster isn't half bad actually for what it is. Like it's, it's oversized, a, but uh, there's a whole segment where every uh, the entire like country is like destroy all closets. Right. And exactly. so the, and, oh, every, wow. and like there's grandmas fucking burning their closets. Yeah, <laughs> there's like a samurai dude in like Japan like using his samurai sword to destroy his closet. Yeah, yeah, destroying like his that. closet door. And there's like yeah. all these like hilarious tropes where it's like, oh, we know how to communicate with the monster now, and all it does is get the scientist killed by the yeah. monster, right? Oh, nice. so, that sounds so good. Like, yeah, check it out. It's yeah. um I think it's on Prime or something like that. And, I'll and go my, with with a, a slightly. I mean, it's this is not unknown, but but uh, Day of the Beast by uh, Alex de la Iglesia. I feel I feel any of, uh, of Alex de la Iglesia's early work, which in was, which, is what yeah, I know. Yeah, was yeah. was brilliant uh, horror comedy. But Day of the Beast is great. It's you know it's about a priest that needs to make as many sins as he can to 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 bring out the Antichrist. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ooh, it's pretty sounds, great. Yeah. And and my my pick, uh, my recent pick is. Is uh, I'm just fucking with you, which is uh, the Hulu Into the Dark series. Is, is that good, movie. really? It is uh, absolutely phenomenal. It is, li like I said, it is what uh, Bad Time at El Royale should have been. Okay. Oh. It is. Right. It is a, a noir horror, like kind of like the Sadist, or you know, I don't know if you guys ever saw the Sadist, but uh, this, you know, it's it's just nasty. Uh, and really, really funny. Okay. All right. Impressive. Yeah. I'll check it out. And yeah. you know what? I'm going to, you know, to kind of tie in the film quest thing too from the beginning. Let me give you guys a film that I thought was fantastic. Uh, we programmed it. Uh, I know it played Fantasia and stuff like that. Really great. I'm not sure if you could call it horror, but it definitely has horror elements in it. It's definitely like a Lovecraft horror, but not yeah. really. <laughs> uh, but it was called uh, Lake Michigan Monster. 
And okay. if you okay. guys haven't heard of it, find it if you can. Seek it out. Lake Michigan Monster, made for seven grand. Okay. Uh, wow. Black and white. I mean, these guys, like, what they did was they made the visual effects kind of, like, degrade and look beat up and worse, which made it look better. Because, okay. Okay. like, it had aged in time with this. Really clever, really great. And when that thing hits the second half, that thing is just dynamite, right? All right. I have to stick with it for a moment because you're like, where is this going? But seriously, guys, like, huge crowd pleaser, totally up your alley, especially for any horror comedy nerd or anybody going for it. You're going to love, like, Michigan Monster. Great, uh, great. What, what, one Cut of the Dead, also a fantastic Oh, show. okay, I haven't seen that. Oh, oh, my really list. Look forward to that. Yeah. Genius, uh, genius. All right, so it's time to wrap this up. Uh, Mike, uh, where can people find you online? Tell us... Uh, uh, at Madman Mendez on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, it's probably the easiest. Okay, and Jonathan? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Johnny Astros, J O H double N Y A S T R O S, as you can see. Yep, I know. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that guy. Going on. Yeah, I know that's going on. Or you can go to my website, bohemianindustries.com, or my film festival is filmquestfest.com, which you can also find on Facebook, Instagram, all that. It's all of the above. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much. And, uh, and we'll see you in the next horror time. Thank you all for listening to My Favorite Horror Movie. Please subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, and catch our videos on YouTube. All of those links and ways to pick up our books are at MyFavoriteHorrorMovie.com. My Favorite Horror Movie is a Black Vortex Cinema production. Thank you all, and we'll see you soon, evil ones.